Janis Joplin had one of the most powerful and impressive voices in the history of music, but that's honestly one of the least interesting parts of her story. So I'm really excited to dig in and talk more in depth about the story of Janis Joplin. This is gonna be another long one, so I hope you enjoy it. If you do enjoy these stories from music history, consider subscribing. I post a couple videos a month and a bunch of shorts all about music history and telling what I think are interesting stories from music history. Subscribing is free to do and it's very easy to unsubscribe if you decide you're just not feeling it. She's a pretty bird and she wobbles. Janice Lynn Joplin was born in 1943 in the little oil town of Port Arthur, Texas to Dorothy and Seth Joplin. Her mother, Dorothy East, grew up watching her parents really struggle in their marriage. Eventually, the family went bankrupt, and Dorothy's parents spent a lot of time separated, where Dorothy's dad fell in love with alcohol in the kind of party scene, and Dorothy's mom fell into super fundamentalist Christianity. As you might expect, those two worlds didn't really mix all that well. So through all that turmoil, Dorothy kind of found refuge in singing, which is something that her father really encouraged and her mother really didn't like all that much. During Christmas vacation, she met Seth Joplin, who grew up on a ranch in West Texas. Seth was always more of a loner who really loved books more than people and more than West Texas ranch hands typically did. He studied mechanical engineering at the University of Alabama, but dropped out a few credits shy of graduation because he ran out of money. So when he met Dorothy, he was working as a gas station attendant at a service center. When Dorothy went back to college, the two spent a lot of time writing really romantic letters back and forth, and they kind of figured out that they both had the same ideas and the same dreams about wanting to make something better out of their lives than their parents had. So they got married and moved to Port Arthur, where there were plenty of jobs available in the oil industry. The Texas company, which was later renamed to Texaco, saw Seth's potential, and they offered him a job at kind of overseeing the construction of metal containers. They spent about seven years just kind of getting their feet under them, and then Janice was born on January 19th, 1943. She came early and only weighed five pounds and six ounces when she was born, but otherwise she was very healthy. Seth couldn't attend the birth, but he did write a memo, which said, quote, I wish to tender my congratulations on the anniversary of your successful completion of your production quota for the nine months ending January 19th, 1943. End quote. Growing up, Janice was always very close to Seth. He taught her to love reading and taught her how to speak up for herself and be kind of independent and do what she wanted to do. Both of her parents really encouraged her love of music from a very early age. Dorothy said, quote, She started piano lessons to learn scales and keys. I found some wonderful books of children's songs so she could learn to sing and I could play the primary note on the piano and she could get the pitch. She learned to sing folk songs and started singing them when she went to bed at night. It was absolutely enchanting. End quote. Janice could always sense that her father wanted a son, and that probably contributed to her becoming quite a bit of a tomboy when she was a kid. But probably because of her love of reading, she was also very book smart and ended up moving up a couple of grades in school, so she was always smaller and younger than her classmates. She learned to hold her own with her massive personality and attitude, though. When she got to high school, Janice started to struggle a little bit socially. She was singing a lot in the church choir and in the glee club, but because of Seth's encouragement for her to be outspoken and to share what she was thinking, she was very vocal about some opinions that other people didn't necessarily like, particularly opinions about how stupid racial segregation was. That opinion started to get her bullied quite a bit. She said, quote, I was a misfit. I read, I painted, I thought. I didn't hate black people. Also, as she hit high school, she started to lose that close relationship she had with Seth. She felt like he was cutting her out and they weren't having these deep talks that they used to have. She just felt like he didn't care as much anymore. She also had two younger siblings, Laura, born in 1949, and Michael, born in 1951. So that took some of her parents' attention away from Janice. And if there was anything that Janice loved, it was attention, and she would find any way she could to get it. In 1957, Janice read the book On the Road by Jack Carew, which completely changed her outlook on life. She became super infatuated with the beat bohemian lifestyle. It really made her dream about getting out into the world and having these adventures and seeing things, but it also impacted the way she dressed and thought and how she acted in school 
which led to even more bullying. She later said about her senior year, quote, I didn't have anyone to talk to, end quote. But she did make some friends, and she even went with one of them, who was named Carlene, to see a movie called Gigi. They were super fascinated by the scene where Gigi learns how to make a good cocktail for some of her male friends. I say friends, trying to be friendly to the YouTube algorithm. Carlene's mom did the whole it's better for them to drink at home than somewhere else reasoning and made them a couple whiskey sours. Carlene said, quote, it was the first drink Janice ever had. We made her promise she wouldn't tell her parents. But pretty soon Janice fell in love with alcohol. She loved the way it eased the anxiety and the self-consciousness she always felt. She had a super sensitive mind, so anything she could do to kind of put a blanket over that and dampen it, she was all in. Janice was a pretty good artist, and coming out of high school, that's what she wanted to do with her life. After one particularly tough moment when she was 17, when she, quote, took a lot of pills, drank huge quantities of wine, and flipped out, end quote, Janice was hospitalized and had to see a psychiatrist and a psychologist to kind of figure out what was going on with her. But then she started to struggle even more in her classes, which she coped with by drinking even more. In 1961, Janice saw the West Coast for the first time when she went to live with Dorothy's sister in Los Angeles. She had recently graduated from like a keyboardist certificate program, so she went out to live with Mildred to kind of figure out if she could get a job as a typist out there. Soon she saved enough money to rent her own little apartment in Venice where she really fell in love with the hippie and beatnik community that was flourishing there. Eventually she ran out of money, became mentally exhausted, and pretty strung out, so she had to return home. But that love of the West Coast and the close-knit beat community she found there never died. Nobody knows you. When you're down and out. When she got back home, she knew she had to do something, so she convinced her parents to let her enroll in the University of Texas at Austin to study art. Austin quickly became a place where she started to find herself and find more freedom. And it was in Austin that Janice found herself as a singer. I think she realized that she was never going to get the recognition that she craved through her art. She just wasn't as talented as maybe she originally thought, and she loved the attention she got when she sang, so she shifted her focus and put all of her energy into that. While in Austin, she formed a little folk group called the Waller Creek Boys, which was named after a small polluted creek that cut through the center of the University of Texas campus. They started to sing around the Austin area, where Janice got a little bit of attention and recognition for her very blues and soulful sound. She idolized a lot of blues singers who put so much emotion and passion into their voices, so that's what Janice tried to do. They mostly played at a place called Threadgill's Bar, which was run by a guy named Kenneth Threadgill, who would host open mic nights that the UT students loved. Kenneth Threadgill kind of became an early mentor for Janice, someone that she really looked up to and cherished. Powell St. John, who was one of the Waller Creek boys, became Janice's boyfriend, and soon after they broke up, Janice suffered a miscarriage, which is something that didn't really seem to affect Janice all that much if she even thought about it. But by that time, she was doing a lot of drinking and partying, not a lot of school or studying. On January 19th, 1963, Janice played one last show with the Waller Creek boys at Threadgill's, before hopping in a car and heading to California. A good friend of hers named Chet Helms insisted that they should go to San Francisco, where Janice's voice would knock people out. So they did, meandering across the country and taking their time, just like the book On the Road. In San Francisco, she started to perform in a couple different coffee shops and clubs and just kind of making a name for herself and making some friends and connections in the beat community that was just starting to kick off there. She even met the future guitarist of Jefferson Airplane and recorded a few blues songs with him. But she also became more and more dependent on alcohol and added a dependency to methamphetamine to the mix. She got a reputation as being a bit of a speed freak, but things got really bad when she drove to New York City and spent a few months there. At least as far as we can tell, she didn't do much performing while she was in New York. She mostly just hustled pool games for money and did a lot of pills and drank a lot at some local gay bars. Sometimes she would stay with Edward and Janice Knoll, who were friends of hers, and they lived on the Lower East Side, and they taught her how to inject speed. After that, things fell apart pretty quickly for Janice. She went back to San Francisco and slipped deeper and deeper into her methamphetamine addiction to the point that her friends were really worried about her. She started to lose a ton of weight and looked just very unhealthy. Chet said, quote, she was emaciated, almost catatonic, just not responding. Janice would change her mind 200 times before she got to the door. That's like terminal speed. 
end quote. Through Edward and Janice Knoll, who had relocated from the Lower East Side to San Francisco, she met a guy named Peter de Blanc and fell madly in love with him. Peter had all these grand stories about his life. He said he came from old money and that he had a master's degree in engineering, which immediately reminded Janice of her dad, Seth. Spoiler alert, none of that was true. He was really charismatic and a super smooth talker, who also happened to have his own drug issues and spent some time in the hospital for delusions. Eventually, Janice's friends convinced her that she needed to get clean, so they threw a party to raise money, got her a bus ticket, and she returned to Port Arthur. Janice agreed to this mostly because she wanted to marry Peter, so she thought it was a good idea to get clean to start that new life with him. When she got back to Port Arthur, she weighed about 88 pounds and slept for several days. As she was detoxing from the speed, she suffered very serious depression and paranoia. But her visions of a new life with Peter gave her something to hold on to. It was a stable, simple life, unlike anything she had known up to that point. It was a white picket fence life, and she wanted it badly. Once Peter came to visit Janice in Port Arthur, and he talked to Seth and asked for Seth's permission to marry Janice... Seth agreed, and the family all loved Peter, but he flew back to New York, he said, to get things ready. It's just too bad that he had several other girlfriends and no money and some pretty serious mental health issues that he was dealing with. Through her many letters to Peter, you can kind of see Janice start to realize that maybe Peter's not who he said he was, and he had no intention of marrying her. The breakdown of that relationship made it really difficult for Janice to really fully trust people in the future. It put a massive fence in the way of her ever finding true, real love. Seth Joplin always called it the Saturday Night Swindle. It was this idea that you worked so hard and gave so much of yourself for this great, big, grand idea, and then it always lets you down. It's kind of a philosophy that life is just full of disappointments. The Peter situation was Janice's biggest Saturday night swindle, and she never let herself fall in love after that, at least not in the same white picket fence way that she did with Peter. Instead, she threw herself into her music and sang in a lot of clubs in Houston and in the nearby Louisiana towns. She even returned to Austin and performed at a lot of clubs there, which is where Chet Helms sent for her. In the time that Janice was getting clean in Port Arthur, Chet Helms had made quite a bit of a name for himself in the San Francisco community. He had started this hippie community called Family Dog and started Family Dog Productions in order to promote concerts at the Fillmore Auditorium. Through his work with Family Family Dog Productions, Chet had formed this little psychedelic rock band that he thought Janice had the perfect voice for. So on June 6, 1966, Janice made it back to San Francisco and met Big Brother and the Holding Company. The band had been formed by Peter Alban and Sam Andrew when they had played together at Peter's house back in, like, 1965. Peter had grown up in San Francisco, and he was a part of that folky beat scene of the early 60s, which was where he originally met Janice during her first stay in San Francisco. He was originally a guitarist, but he switched to bass in order to make room for a friend of his to join the band. Sam Andrew was born in Taft, California, and he was the son of a military family. When he was 17, Sam was living in Okinawa, where he had formed his own band, and he actually had a regular TV spot on the Okinawan version of American Bandstand. He spent some time living in Europe before coming home and meeting Peter Albin. When they met, he was a grad student at the University of California in Berkeley studying linguistics. Peter and Sam soon asked their friend named James Gurley to join the band with them. He was more experimental and honestly just better than both of them, so Peter stepped to the side to play bass while James took over lead guitar. James was from Detroit, and he taught himself how to play guitar when he was about 19. James spent some time studying how to be a priest before he and his wife moved to San Francisco in 1962. Before that, James had spent some time working as a human hood ornament in his father's daredevil act, and he and his wife Nancy also spent some time living in Mexico studying the occult. James Gurley is a very fascinating guy. Originally, the band started with drummer Chuck Jones, but by the time Janice joined, he had been replaced by Dave Getz. Originally born in Brooklyn, Dave had earned his fine arts degree from the San Francisco Art Institute. When he was asked to join the band, he was teaching, but he also liked to play a lot of jazz in his free time. When these guys first got together and started playing, Chet Helms heard them and knew there was something to it. So he named them, started to charge people for coming to their parties, and became their de facto manager. Once Janice joined the group, 
group, she was immediately attracted to James Gurley. I mean, with a backstory like his, how could you not be? He's like the most interesting man in the world territory. James' wife Nancy and their son Hongo were always around the band. But Nancy really believed in the free love movement, so that didn't stop Janice and James from hooking up pretty often. Big Brother and the Holding Company became staples of the family dog and San Francisco beat slash hippie scene. Janice started to come into her own on stage and got way more comfortable and confident while she was performing. So she wanted to dress the part and get the whole look down. She said, quote, I want the audiences to look at me as a real performer, whereas now the look is just one of us who stepped on stage. End quote. So she started to wear a lot of gold lame, which I think probably got the point across. The band, while decent, couldn't really match Janice's talent level, and people started to notice that. Only a few months after joining the band, Janice was approached by Elektra Records with this idea of forming a blues folk supergroup. Janice went as far as to go down to Berkeley, California to jam with them. But joining that new group, which was a very exciting opportunity for her, would mean leaving Big Brother and the Holding Company and kind of forsaking that family that she had found there. In typical hippie community fashion, the band all lived in the same house together with their spouses and children and shared everything and really developed a family bond. Dave Getz said that the philosophy at that time was that a band was like a sacred trust. When Janice told the band about Electra's offer, Peter Alban threw a fit. He said, quote, It was a terrible, traumatic experience. We were all living together, and we were like a family. She said that what she always wanted was to make records and be famous and a star. End quote. Janice did eventually turn down the offer from Electro Records, and she stayed with Big Brother and the Holding Company, who quickly got a residency playing at a blues club in Chicago. Since she adored that Chicago blues sound, it was a dream come true for Janice, but it quickly deteriorated. A woman left the Chicago blues audiences really didn't understand the more psychedelic sound that was coming out of the West Coast. After a few weeks, the club stopped paying Big Brother, so they were left with only their portion of the door receipts, which was often less than $100 a night. They had no plane tickets home and no money to buy any, so they were stuck. Enter Bobby Shad. Bobby was the founder of Mainstream Records, which was an independent jazz label, and he's also the grandfather of Judd Apatow. He had previously auditioned Big Brother back in San Francisco, going through their manager Chet Helms. While they were playing, Bobby said he really liked them, and he offered them a six-month, three-single deal. Then, Chet said, quote, He started outlining how he's going to screw the band out of their publishing. We're going to screw them out of this, screw them out of that. They'll never know the difference. Chet didn't stand for that, and he ended the audition right there and cut off contact with Bobby Shad. But with the group stranded in Chicago without Chet Helms there to protect them, Bobby smelled blood in the water. He offered them a contract with recording sessions to take place in Chicago, like, immediately. The band thought that the advance that they could get from that recording contract would be enough to get them out of Chicago and back to San Francisco, but they also thought there was an added benefit of it tying Janice to them on a more permanent basis. But the five-year contract they signed gave them absolutely no advance and gave mainstream recordings 50% of their publishing. Sam Andrews said, quote, We were naive kids. We asked him for a thousand dollar advance, and he said no. We said five hundred, he said no. We asked, can we have plain fare home? He said not one penny. End quote. Instead, Bobby booked them some recording sessions in Chicago and paid them the union scale, which was about ninety dollars each. Regardless, they were all excited to record, but the sessions did not go well. The engineers and producers had no idea how to get the band's signature sound onto a recording. Sam said, quote, The guitar sound was pure 1950s, and James and I were unhappy with it, but didn't know how to correct it. We didn't know how to ask for what we wanted, and they were not about to volunteer anything. For her part, Janice loved the process of recording and was excited that they were at least doing something that felt commercially viable, even if it wasn't perfect. Back in San Francisco, Janice got back into her drinking and partying ways, and the band decided to move on from Chet Helms. Chet had become super overworked running Family Dog Productions and managing the Fillmore Auditorium, so they hired a new manager, a guy named Julius Carpin. During the summer of 1967, some music industry bigwigs from Los Angeles made the trip to San Francisco in order to entice some bands to come play the music festival they were putting together. A few months before that, Chet Helms and a few other music industry people in the San Francisco area held a press conference and announced the Summer of Love, kind of anticipating a whole bunch of hippies coming to San Francisco 
to see the scene that was happening there. And Hollywood wanted a piece of that. So Lou Adler and John Phillips from the Mamas and the Pampas came to San Francisco to ask bands to play at their festival, which they were calling the Monterey International Pop Festival. They offered to pay expenses for the bands to get there, but no performance fees. A lot of the San Francisco scene saw this as an obvious cash grab and an attempt to exploit the scene that they had worked so hard to build. But regardless, a lot of them recognized the opportunity, so they agreed to play. During their first performance, Janis stole the show. Joe Selvin wrote, quote, It was as if the earth had opened up. The audience was spellbound, startled at the crude power unleashed. She was the first real hit of the festival, a taste of what everybody had come to see. End quote. The festival organizers planned to film the set and release a kind of documentary about it, but Big Brother's new manager, who was super overprotective of their image and style and sound, refused to let Big Brother and the holding company be filmed for it. Knowing that this film would not be an accurate representation of the festival if they didn't have Janis Joplin in it, the directors begged for Big Brother and the Holding Company to play another set that they could film. Julia still very much did not want them to be in the film, but Janice knew the exposure it could give them, and she begged for it. So they played another set and were added to the film. Also at that festival, Clive Davis saw Janice perform and knew there was something really special about her. From that moment on, he desperately wanted to sign Big Brother and the Holding Company, but mostly Janice. In order to capitalize on the massive press attention the band was getting, Bobby Shad and Mainstream Records released their album simply called Big Brother and the Holding Company. And pretty much immediately after it was released, the band denounced it. They adamantly refused to participate in any publicity for it, but the album was still at least a minor success. Meanwhile, they were fielding calls from Clive Davis with Columbia Records, who was desperately trying to sign them. The band was on the rise. Everyone could sense that they were on the verge of taking that next step out of that small community that they came from. In a letter to her family, Janice wrote, quote, Wow, I met two of the Rolling Stones, most of the animals, and these are big groups, well-respected and rich, and they say I'm the best they've ever heard. Well, anyway, I'm ecstatic. This band is my whole life now. It is to all of us. I really am totally committed and I dig it. I'm quite proud of myself because I'm really trying. End quote. In August of 1967, her family came to visit her for the first time and it didn't go well. She took them to see a Big Brother and the Holding Company show at the Avalon and her parents were really put off by the whole scene and what was happening there. Janice took that as a complete disapproval of her whole life and everything she had worked for. When they left and went back to Texas, it basically severed that relationship and nothing was ever the same after that. Janice resorted to a lot more drinking and a lot more drugs to cope with that. Sometime in late 1967, after a show, James Gurley introduced Janice to heroin. It was a numbness unlike anything she had ever felt and one that she would never stop craving. One of her boyfriends later commented that Janice had such a sensitive mind that he didn't think there was any way she would ever get past heroin addiction since heroin was just like a big blanket that you could throw over all of the pain that you felt. I mean, I've never done heroin, never planned to, so taken him at his word for it. People in her life urged her to stay away from heroin, but it was useless. Janice was hooked. As the band got bigger and bigger, they knew that they needed to take that next step into commercial success, and they also knew that Julius was not the manager to get them there. He was totally fine for the San Francisco scene, but for a artists being courted by Columbia Records, they needed something bigger. So they met with Albert Grossman. In 1961, Albert had put together Peter, Paul, and Mary. And then in 1962, he signed one of Janice's idols, Bob Dylan. So he was the big time. But Albert's first wife was really addicted to heroin. So his one and only rule was absolutely no schmeeze, as he called it. The band readily agreed to that condition with at least James Gurley knowing that he was lying. So Albert became their manager. Over the next few months, James Gurley really started to decline. He was drinking a lot, using a ton of heroin, and when he saw Jimi Hendrix perform, it made him super insecure about his own talent. In January of 1968, while they were performing and Albert was watching them from the audience, James almost collapsed on stage. So Albert called a band meeting, minus James, and suggested that they move on from James Gurley and pay him something like $10,000 severance, but the band adamantly refused. They were still a family. Dave Getz said about James' issues, quote, everybody tried to avoid it, deny it, look the other way. 
end quote. Janice and Sam Andrew were also still using heroin, but not to the same extent that James was, and they were able to keep it hidden from Albert. Eventually, Columbia Records was able to pay a ton of money to get the band out of that mainstream record deal they signed in Chicago, and they signed to Columbia, and Columbia sent them to New York to record their album. During that recording, James really struggled. Dave Getz said, quote, It was really excruciating sometimes to get a good solo out of him without screwing up or striking a bad note. End quote. That album, which they called Cheap Thrills, a shortened version of the name they actually wanted to use, was released on August 12th, 1968, and it hit number one in the charts. By the end of 1968, it had become the best-selling album of the year, and a big tour was planned in support of it. But throughout this whole season, people kept telling Janice to leave Big Brother. It became super apparent that Janice's talent was so much bigger than the band's, and now with several of them falling deeper and deeper into drug issues, became even more obvious. But Janice had always refused. They were still a family. But that started to change in 1968. But by the summer of 1968, it had finally sunk into Janice that it was time to leave. Sam Andrews said, quote, She felt like some of the people in Big Brother weren't working as hard as we were, and that was the truth. She was getting impatient. By that time, the band wasn't much of a family anymore. When they weren't playing or recording, they all went their separate ways and lived separate from each other. Janice asked a lot of different people for advice before she made her decision, but eventually she called a band meeting and said that she was leaving the group. Predictably, Peter Albin threw a fit, but the rest of the band members kind of understood and sensed it coming. What they really didn't like was that Janice was taking Sam Andrew with her. After Janice left, Peter Albin and Dave Getz joined Country Joe and the Fish, but they left that in May of 1969 in order to reform Big Brother and the Holding Company. Eventually, in the fall of 1969, they got James Gurley and Sam Andrew back, meaning the original lineup was back together, just minus Janice. With some lineup changes, they remained a band until 1972, when infighting kind of got the best of them and they split up. They reformed in 1987 with the original lineup, but James Gurley left again in 1997 because he disagreed with the band's idea to hire a new female lead singer to replace Janice. After that, James kind of launched his own solo career and played with a few other musicians, and in 1970, Nancy, his wife, passed away from a drug overdose. James was charged with her death since he was the one that injected her. I've seen some people say he was acquitted. I see some people say that he got like a probationary sentence. I'm not really sure what happened, but he never actually served any prison time for it. He passed away in 2009 from a heart attack. Peter Alban and Dave Getz continue to play for Big Brother and the Holding Company. Back in 1969, Janice's new band was kind of a mess. Even though they were good musicians, she didn't know how to lead a band, and that showed. While her and Sam were slipping further and further into heroin addiction, the band struggled to get any kind of cohesion or organization going. They called the band the Cosmic Blues Band, and it was a rotating lineup of different musicians before they finally settled on a group that really gelled well together. By this time, it is estimated that Janice was injecting something like $200 worth of heroin a day, but efforts were made to keep her clean while they recorded her first solo album. Released in September of 1969, I Got Them Old Cosmic Blues Again, Mama, hit gold status within two months, but it wasn't her best-reviewed album, and it probably still ranks pretty low in terms of people's favorites. After the album was released on Albert's advice, Janice fired Sam Andrew. Sam didn't really react all that much, and when Janice asked him if he wanted to know why he was fired, Sam Andrew said, what difference does it make? Sam went back to working with Big Brother, but when they broke up in 1972, he went to New York and started a career scoring films. Eventually in the 90s, he would start his own project called the Sam Andrew Band. He passed away in 2015 after complications from open heart surgery. On August 17th, 1969, at roughly 2 a.m., Janice took the stage at Woodstock. Because of so many delays with other acts, Janice was forced to spend about 10 hours waiting backstage which she spent drinking and doing heroin, so that probably accounted for her somewhat subpar performance at Woodstock. I could do a whole episode on the Woodstock experience and what happened there, so for now I'll just leave it at that. On April 4th, 1970, Janice joined Big Brother and the Holding Company on stage at the Fillmore West. It was the first time they had played together since the split, and it would end up being the last. Around this time, Janice started to get really exhausted with the social attention of being a rock star. She wanted something just for herself. 
So she came up with a nickname for her bandmates and her close friends to call her that no one else knew. She settled on the name Pearl, and I think it was an attempt to make her feel less alone and more known. For her next album, she was teamed up with Paul Rothschild, who was already a pretty well-known producer in the Laurel Canyon scene. He had produced The Doors' first five albums, and just kind of as a side note, Janis really hated Jim Morrison. For at least a few months before they started recording that album, Janis made a real serious attempt to get off heroin. She had met a guy while she was vacationing in Brazil, and she fell really in love with him, and for his sake, she tried to get clean, and it worked for at least several months. She did make one last trip to Port Arthur, Texas for her high school reunion, which she thought would be this big hero's welcome coming home, and it wasn't that. It just kind of fell flat, and it ended with her getting in a screaming match with her mother. Janice had started a relationship with a guy named Seth Morgan, and when she got back to LA for the recording sessions, she threw herself into that relationship. Seth was a drug dealer, and they met when Seth delivered cocaine to Janice's home. The two would eventually get engaged. Even though Janice was loving the process of recording this album, she loved her band, she loved working with Paul, she loved the music, she still couldn't stay clean and started using heroin again. On September 18th, her friend Jimi Hendrix died after drug use, and when called for a comment, Janice said, quote, there but for the grace of God, I wonder what they'll say about me after I die. End quote. Around that time, Janice also saw Al Wilson, who was the singer of Canned Heat, die from a drug overdose, and the year before, Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones. All of this, paired with her inability to stay clean, put her in a really depressed and pessimistic mood. Though she was still super optimistic about the music that she was making. On Saturday, October 3rd, she met the band at Sunset Studios and did a little bit of work before leaving and getting drinks with Ken Pearson. She went back to the Landmark, her hotel, alone and injected heroin in a way that was a little bit different than the way she typically did it. I don't want to get too much into the weeds with it, but the basic outcome was that the effects of the heroin hit about 10 minutes later instead of hitting immediately. So after that, she went down to the lobby, talked with the receptionist, got some cigarettes, and then when she got back up to her hotel room, the heroin hit and she collapsed. It shut down her lungs and her heart almost immediately. And she died at about 1 a.m. on October 4th at only 27 years old. Janice had no idea that the heroin that she injected was something called China White, which was brought into the country by a French guy that was allegedly Keith Richards' dealer. It was something like 40 to 50% pure, where her normal dose was about 10% pure. So you pair that with her being clean for several months, and her tolerance just was not there to handle this. Around 7.30 that evening, John Cook found her body. In January of 1971, her final album, which was called Pearl, Pearl was released. It became the highest selling album of her career, generating over 8 million in sales, and Me and Bobby McGee became her first number one single. The producer Paul Rothschild said about her death, quote, Janice's death was the most devastating thing in my life. We decided we'd be together forever. It was the most fun we'd ever had in the studio. She was always 110% there. Still in a funk from her death, Paul declined to produce The Doors' next album, which would end up being their last with Jim Morrison. Because in July of 1971, Jim Morrison died of an overdose from heroin allegedly supplied by the same dealer that supplied Janice's. Janice Joplin redefined what it meant to be a female rock star. She set that template and she flung the doors wide open. Every female rocker after her and probably all of the male ones also, owe a massive amount of debt to what she was able to accomplish. And that's the story of Janis Joplin. Let me know if you liked it. Leave a comment below with anything I got wrong. Share it with a friend you think might like it.